All right, so uh, Marcos Melitzas of Daily Kos. Uh, thanks for coming on TPM TV. We're going to run through uh, a few quick questions about the 2008 presidential race and also about the Daily Kos website. Now, uh, just a few days ago, uh, National Journal's Beltway blog roll wrote this. They said a presidential endorsement for Marcos Melitza Suniga of Daily Coast could change the dynamics of the Democratic race, which is no doubt a factor in Melitza's decision to stay neutral thus far this year. Now, I know you're not doing an endorsement. You're not planning on doing an endorsement. But there's a couple ways one cannot do an endorsement, and I want to ask you about that. Uh, given you're not going to do a formal endorsement of one of the candidates, but as you think about the next four or five months, the, the primary season, depending on how long it lasts, do you plan as you blog to basically think out loud for the readers of your site to give them a sense of when you're thinking this thing about this candidate or gravitating, gravitating more in one direction or another? Or are you going to keep it closer to the vest so people really don't have a sense of, of what you're thinking about uh, the different candidates? Well, I think I already have, uh, throughout this last year, really thought out loud about my thoughts on each one of the candidates. I've made it very clear that, that a couple of the candidates are, are completely unacceptable uh, to me, uh, mainly Joe Biden and uh, Dennis Kucinich. I've also expressed quite a bit of, uh, of uh, skepticism about Hillary Clinton. I, I've come out and said that in the Daily Coast straw poll, uh, after almost a year of voting uh, no clue, I finally picked a candidate. I picked uh, uh, Chris Dodd of Connecticut. Not necessarily because I actually think I'm going to vote for him, but it, it was a way to reward his behavior during the Iraq debate. Um, so I, I've really, at this point, given who I've ruled out, um, I also ruled out John Edwards because of his decision to pay publicly, uh, public funds for the primary, which I think would be a disastrous uh, situation if he wins a nomination because he'd be absolutely broke for almost six months until the uh, until the general election started. So at this point I've narrowed it down to uh, Barack Obama and Chris Dodd. Uh, you know, I, I like Dodd better. I mean, I, I think if you can morph the candidates, put Dodd's rhetoric and his, and his record into Obama, I think we'd have the perfect candidate. But at this point it comes down to when I get a chance to vote in, uh, in California in February, uh, my vote's actually going to matter this time, and so I'm going to have to decide between voting for Chris Dodd, which is probably going to be a wasted vote, or for uh, Barack Obama. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm fairly open about this. I, I don't think there's any secrets w with my audience, and uh, at the end of the day, I, I have no plans on making any kind of so sort of formal endorsement because I, I think we're a very educated, politically savvy crowd. They're not looking to me, to make up their own minds about who to support. They're going to make up their own minds, and I respect that, and I'm not going to get in the way of that. What is it about Chris Dodd that has you thinking so highly of his candidacy when most people are focusing on, you know, the, what are seen as the, the top three, you know, first-tier candidates? Well, you know, Chris Dodd has one of these luxuries of, of uh, the, the uh, sort of second-tier, third-tier presidential candidate in which he can really do or say anything he wants without having some DC consultant telling him to tone it down because he might offend this or that constituency. I think Obama could have been that person if he didn't have uh, you know, the, the usual uh, DC consultant crowd, uh, in this case they, uh, Axelrod who's actually a Chicago consultant, but same, same crowd, they run in the same circles, uh, clearly telling him to tone things down and to run a safe race, which you only get to do if you're the front runner and Obama was never the front runner. So Obama's played it safe. Everybody else seems to be playing it safe. Hillary Clinton is definitely playing it safe. So finally, you know, people like me are looking for somebody to, to, to be inspired, who, who gives us the kind of uh, rhetoric and policy proposals that actually seem to move the Democratic Party forward. And Chris Dodd on, on bank, bankruptcy reform, on, uh, on the war in Iraq, on civil liberties. I mean, this is a guy who's essentially running on a platform of restoring the Bill of Rights. I mean, how much more inspiring can you get than that, especially in this climate uh, and with this administration, which has made absolutely clear that their number one mission in life is to eviscerate the Bill of Rights. So you have a candidate that's latched on to a very timely issue, one that, has very, very, that is very relevant and actually is of a great importance uh, right now, and that's Chris Dodd. And, and I wish that he was more of a viable candidate. I wish he, he, uh, uh, he was in the top tier. Then I, can, I think I could get really excited about him 
as it is, I wish some of the top tier candidates would speak in the way that Chris Dodd does. You've ruled out uh, John Edwards for, for the reasons you, you just mentioned. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Hillary and Obama. Let's, I want to talk both about their positions, but also just the kinds of races they're running at the moment. Uh, let, let's go on, on each of them. For, for Hillary, strengths and weaknesses of the race she has run thus far. Um, before I start with that, I hope you can talk about Edwards a little bit because I think it's important. Oh, sure. No, I, I, I was just, since you uh, had ruled him out, but let's, well, let's go through all three then. But as far as Hillary, I mean, she's run the perfect race. I mean, here's somebody who I assumed uh, a year ago would start high and would gradually whittle away support as people became more aware of the opponents. Obviously, the candidate with the higher name recognition, with the higher name ID, is going to do much better in the early rounds. I mean, we saw that with Joel Lieberman. Uh, four years ago. So you have somebody like Hillary Clinton who was universally known, clearly was going to start at the top. I expected that to start shrinking down as people became better acquainted with John Edwards, uh, better acquainted with Barack Obama and some of the other candidates. And in fact, even though they're becoming more acquainted with the other candidates, she's surging in the polls. That is pretty damn impressive, I have to say. And it's a testament to the strength of her as a candidate. I mean, she's unflappable always on message, ruthlessly on message, uh, and it's a testament to a campaign that has kept her uh, very focused on, on, uh, on, on whatever that game plan is, and it's been a very effective game plan. I think that she's done a great job of blurring her position on issues like Iraq and Iran, and I think that may be a detriment, but you know, a, a mark of a good campaign is one that really helps blur those distinctions and gain support of people who might otherwise not support her if they knew that she wasn't as solid on Iraq as some of the other candidates. Do you think that, that Obama has actually helped her blur the Iraq issue? I, or, I mean, I, I think that. Do you, do you think that? It, it's, you know, I, I want to think that he's better on the issue than, than Hillary, that he's more solid on it. Uh, I, I actually do believe strongly that the issue of judgment is important and uh, Obama clearly showed better judgment on the Iraq issue. Uh, I wish he would have shown better judgment on the Iran vote that just happened. Of course, Hillary voted for this resolution. Obama, Obama was nowhere to be around. I mean, I don't, I don't think the Hillary campaign allows a chance like that to, uh, to slip by. The Barack Obama campaign clearly did. So I think that's a, a sign to me of which is a better, more solid campaign and which one isn't really as good. The important thing about Obama is that he has really run a race as though he is the front runner. It's a very safe, calculated uh, campaign, and, and it's frankly very, very uninspiring. I mean, I, I've been to one of these rallies here in Oakland. He had 20,000 people or 15,000, a lot of people. It was crowded. And people show up expecting to be wowed by Barack Obama, you know, the hype. You know, this is a great hope of the Democratic Party. And they walk away, kind of scratching their heads, going, what was that all about? Because really, he, he, re he has refused to provide sort of the red meat and the inspirational language that's going to, to rally people around him. What do you think about the guy who gave the speech at the 2004 Democratic Convention? I mean, what, what happened to that guy? <laughs> I, I think it's the consultants. I mean, I'll, I'll blame it on the consultants because the Barack Obama then is, is clearly uh, a lot more uh, inspirational, a lot more uh, aggressive, a lot more real, I think, than the Obama we've seen to date uh, in this campaign. It really is, is frankly, kind of disappointing. Um, he could have been the Howard Dean of this race, and, and the good parts about Howard Dean, not the, not the flame-out parts, but the good parts, the inspirational, people-powered candidate side of Howard Dean. And, and part of it, again, you know, I blame everything on the campaign, uh, if you go back to the Howard Dean campaign, everything was about people in the audience. It was you have the power, you, you, you. Everything that everybody talked about, look how many people showed up to Howard Dean because they have the power. It's always about the people. Now you see the rhetoric coming out of the Obama campaign after these rallies is they'll say, look how many people showed up to see Obama. So many people came here to see Obama. It's all focused on Obama, which frankly, people aren't that interested in. They want to be inspired. They want to be empowered. The Howard Dean campaign empowered people. The Barack Obama campaign isn't doing as good of a job. If they did, I think it would be a juggernaut, but it hasn't done that. Um, so Edwards, John Edwards. Well, John Edwards, uh, rhetorically, I think has been almost pitch perfect. I mean, he's been great on the rhetorical side. 
again, he's top tier, but he's sort of, you know, second level top tier. So he has the, the opportunity to take a few more risks. He also learned in 2004 about the dangers of allowing consultants to control you, and I think he's been much better on that front about letting consultants control his message. He's going to be his own person, his own campaign, and uh, people will have to love it or leave it uh, and, and make their choice based on the real John Edwards. I like that, and I was, I was really, uh, uh, really gung-ho about the Edwards campaign for a while. Then they made this fateful decision to take public funds for the primary. It, it's a decision that I'm not quite sure why they felt compelled they needed to, to take um, because of spending limits are limited to the, number, the amount of money they can spend in the early states anyway and it seemed he was on his way to raising enough money to compete in Iowa and New Hampshire and Nevada. So I'm not quite sure why he took public money but what that does is it puts a cap of $50 million, about $48 million on what he can spend in the primary and the primary does not end until the convention when the Democratic delegates uh, essentially cor uh, coronate John Edwards as a nominee. So we're talking about going from February, March all the way to the end of August uh, with no money because he's going to spend that $50 million in the early, most of it, the bulk of it in the early part of, that, of the uh, primary. I, mean, I think he's already spent $20 million. I think he's already almost halfway to that cap. So he's essentially told people like me that one, he's not going to take my money anymore. If I want to, if I want to participate in that campaign, I can't unless I, you know, I go knock on doors. But most people don't have that. For most people, giving money is the easiest uh, way that they can show support for a candidate. He said he, he's not going to take my money, and he's also said that that between the end of the primary and to the uh, end of August, there's no way he can respond to Republican attacks. And they're going to dump, uh, last cycle, it was about $150 million that was spent by each side in that summer. We're not going to have any of that. And the Edward campaign says, well, the DNC will pick up the slack. Well, the 527s will pick up the slack. Uh, they can't coordinate with the campaign, so they can't be on message with the Edwards campaign without breaking finance laws. And furthermore, Edwards says that this is a decision based on, on wanting to get big money out of politics. Well, the DNC has a $28,000 uh, uh, fundraising limit uh, or donation limit and 527s are un unregulated. People are getting millions of dollars into these 527s. If you want to get big money out of politics, the way to do that is to encourage small dollar donations like I think the Edwards campaign has done to date and the way the Obama campaign has done it as opposed to depending on institutions that depend on the big financiers and the big money. And quite frankly, that's the money that's corrupting the system, not the $20 donation that a supporter writes or uh, uh, you know, donates online. You had a post, I guess it was maybe last week, speculating to whether it was possible that the, the uh, Democratic National Committee could, you know, hypothetically, Edwards, uh, wins the nomination, it's settled uh, early, you know, early spring, uh, that the, the DNC could just declare him the nominee and that's truncate that period. Did you find out any more on that? Is that even theoretically possible? Yeah, it, it is theoretically possible, but it would require a change of the DNC rules. Right now the DNC rules are fairly clear that it's the convention delegates that nominate the, uh, that officially uh, nominate the, the nominee. Uh, it would take a three-quarters vote of the DNC membership uh, to essentially change the rules. They would have to call a special meeting to make that happen. I think in, a, in, a, in, a, in that situation, just sheer desperation may, may cause us to, to, or may cause the DNC to make that move. But again, it requires a lot of hypotheticals. Well, if this happens, and if that happens, I mean, you have John Edwards who already said that he's going to take matching funds in the general election if the Republicans follow suit. So then we're going to have to deal with, well, okay, we're going to go back on that promise. We're not going to match, we're not going to take federal funds because if you're the Republican, you're clearly going to take matching funds just to force Edwards to have to uh, backtrack and look like a hypocrite on that issue. So it requires a lot of twisting and flailing around and, uh, and a lot of hypotheticals, which I think, quite frankly, are, are dangerous in, in an election as important as this one. And yeah, I know we always say this is the most important election, but in today's world, every election is the most important election we've faced.